Hello everyone and welcome back to Prestige Reef. I'm still away from the tank but I wanted to reveal an experiment which I've been doing the last six months. This experiment is ongoing so why not subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon to receive notifications for when I upload the next video. A little while ago I posted this clip of 35 Bangai Cardinal Fry in my old jellyfish tank. Since then I've had so many people ask what that clip is about. As with any hobby, many of us naturally progress deeper and deeper in an effort to challenge our existing skill set and improve our knowledge. With a marine tank, this often comes in the form of keeping some more delicate livestock or attempting to breed or propagate from our existing livestock. For those of you that are interested in breeding marine fish, the easiest by far are Bangai Cardinals, which are then followed by clownfish. For this video, I'll be focusing just on Bangai's and will cover clownfish at a later date. The reason they are the easiest is because the fish do the majority of the work for us, providing us with fully formed miniatures of themselves which we just need to take care of. Before we get to that however, it's probably wise we start at the beginning. I'm sure I don't need to have the birds and the bees talk with you, but to get the ball rolling, you need to have a male and a female. This is by far the hardest part of the process. Unlike clownfish, which can be paired off pretty easily and will even change sex in certain circumstances, Bangai's have a set gender, and the male and female look virtually identical. They do have some very subtle differences, but they can only really be seen in larger specimens, and even very experienced breeders don't always get it right. Once you have a pair, and you're 100% sure you know which is which, it does get a little easier going forward. Separate the one you know is male from the female, and introduce any new Bangai's to him in a separate tank. If he tries to kill the new fish, it's pretty safe to say you have a male. If he turns on his charm, you have a female. Even that method isn't foolproof though, as it really only works once each fish is at a certain level of maturity. All too often, stores will sell you what they believe is a pair, only for you to discover six months down the line, one of them kills the other, and you're left puzzling as to what went wrong. So what should you look out for when it comes to broodstock? It may sound obvious, but the most important thing is selecting healthy specimens, and preferably from two completely different shops. These fish are now readily bred on an industrial scale, and breeders will sell large batches to one shop. This means the chances are all the fish in one shop are related unless they are wild caught. Wild caught specimens should be avoided as they aren't as hardy and are endangered in their natural habitat. For this species, tank bred fish are readily available, so we don't really have an excuse anymore. The smallest bangais I've ever spawned were around the 1.5 inch mark, from nose to tail, but I would still aim for larger if you can. From experience, I found that smaller males are far more likely to swallow eggs partway through incubation, possibly due to a lack of experience. As previously mentioned, the genders aren't easily distinguishable, however it is often said the males have a wider jaw than the females, something I can barely see unless the male is carrying eggs. Once a pair has been established, and assuming you're keeping on top of your water parameters, high quality food, fed multiple times a day, becomes the most important factor for both male and female. The female needs as much nourishment as possible to allow her to produce a strong, healthy egg clutch. Anything you feed her in the weeks prior to spawning will eventually form the nutrients in the yolk sac, which the fry will live off during their early days. Fry don't always take to feeding immediately, so this yolk sac is vital, and anything you can do to boost its nutritional value might be the difference between success and failure. The male's nutritional requirements are just as important. These fish are mouth brooders, which means once the male has fertilised the eggs, he will then hold them in his mouth for around 21 days. During this time, he can't eat, therefore his body needs to be in optimum condition for him to survive the fasting period. Although he can't eat normally from the water column, it is believed that he will swallow the occasional egg, either by accident or on purpose, as a way to get at least some form of nourishment. In comparison to some of the other fish we keep, their energy consumption is very low, as they aren't rapidly darting around the tank. This swimming style is probably the reason they are able to survive for such a long period of time on a small amount of food. Despite this, as you can see here, the male will lose almost all of their fat reserves, and even their fins start to deteriorate as their body weakens. Now that you've created a stable environment, established you have a breeding pair, and have got them on a high quality diet, it's just a waiting game. Some pairs will spawn very quickly, 
while others will make you wait. Eventually, however, you'll notice them acting in a way which you aren't used to. The male will seduce his lady friend by vibrating on one side of her body, stopping, moving to the other side, and vibrating again. This courtship dance can continue for over an hour before the female eventually releases the egg sac for the male to hold. Once the male is holding the eggs, he will have an extended jaw, like this, and you can finally tell the genders apart with ease. Once the eggs are in his mouth, there is very little you can do other than continue to keep the tank stable and hope you have a good father. It isn't uncommon for the male to consume all the eggs, especially if he's inexperienced or isn't in the right condition to breed. So don't be disheartened if that happens to you. Just wait a month and try again. As the days go by, you'll notice a change in the eggs from an orange to a silver color. This silver is the fry developing eyes, which means it's time for the eggs to hatch. Although the urge to use a torch to look into his mouth will be strong, I strongly advise against it, as this is stressful for the fish and may cause him to swallow the eggs. If you are planning to catch him before he releases the fry, don't worry about not knowing if they've hatched. More often than not, you can see lots of little tails sticking out of his mouth, as even after they have hatched, the fry will remain in his mouth for a couple of days. It's now our turn to take over. I like to catch the male as soon as I can see the fry have hatched. I wait until it's night so the room is completely dark and then I turn the lights on using just the red LEDs at 3%. This usually allows me to catch him pretty quickly and it's 10 times quicker than attempting to catch him during the day. The reason I catch him before he's ready to release the fry is because as soon as he feels trapped he spits them out into the net and it's far easier than trying to catch all the fry individually hiding amongst all the coral. When this has happened previously, the rasses usually pick them off one by one as they are far more agile than I am. Once separated from the rest of the tank, it's time to decide on what to feed them, and this is where my experiment starts. Most people hatch baby brine shrimp as their first food, but I won't be covering that in this video, as I decide to experiment with a different method. If you're interested in how to hatch them though, there are lots of very good videos on YouTube. The problem with hatching baby brine shrimp is it takes additional daily effort and you need to have them prepared prior to the hatch date of the fry. I believe this step is putting many people off, so I thought I'd try something different, raising the fry on frozen food from day one. This would remove the majority of the hassle when it comes to raising these fish, as all you need to do is go to the freezer and pop out a cube. The food I've decided to start with for this experiment is frozen rotifers. The biggest issue I face is getting the fry to identify the rotifers as food. Frozen food sinks, whereas live food wriggles around, triggering a chase response. It also stays suspended in the water column for much longer. Bangai's feed from the water column, therefore once the frozen food has hit the base of the tank, it's no longer of interest to them. This was when I came up with my first idea. I very crudely attached a small pump to a plastic fish bowl and placed it in my sump. The water from the main tank was constantly being pumped into the black bowl, therefore I didn't need to worry about it becoming polluted. I added some rotifers and some did stay suspended, although it was far from perfect. I tried this method with two batches, which had mixed results. I had issues with the flow being too strong, the fry escaping the container, and also the flow was very direct, leaving dead spots for the food to collect it. It wasn't a complete failure though. The fry were eating and growing something I had long thought was impossible. The survival rate wasn't as high as when I was feeding live food, but this was a proof of concept, so I decided to scale it up for my next batch. This is where my old jellyfish tank from Cubic Aquariums fits in, but you'll have to wait until the next video for that one. Let me know in the comments section what you think will happen and if you've got any ideas of how I can improve. That's it for today guys, have a good week and I'll see you next time.